China's rampant theft of intellectual property is real. 美国啊，就是要在二十一世纪复活冷战。About financial war with U.S. The sparring between the United States and China has taken a new twist with student visas now in the firing line. 你们国家跟国家打仗，不要再让我们学生，我们学生好无辜呀。我们华为啊，正经历一个美国第三轮制裁的困难时期。The conflict with China will outlast the Trump administration. The root causes of the conflict stretches back decades. They blame China's entry into the WTO as being responsible for the loss of their jobs and their communities. What happened to the factories? They used them up. Everybody downsized. They just split. For China. The reason for mistrust even goes back to the last century. Many people think of the Yuan River as a symbol of Chinese colonialism, a symbol of the Western countries being the first countries to be conquered by the Chinese. The conflict is We talk about this being the land of opportunity, and if you're poor, this is not the land of opportunity. This is the land of a very deep funnel that you've fallen in, and you're trying to climb back up, and there's no handles. America, in fact, is trying to use Hong Kong to go to the United States and to be conquered. 九年出生。中国在过去三十年的变化是非常大的。那举一个例子，就是小的时候，我成长于九十年代和两千年初，呃，那个时候现在回想起来，呃，其实，在物质上是非常要跟现在相比是非常匮乏的。冬天的时候，你吃的蔬菜水果只有那几种。白菜、萝卜这些非常常见的东西，嗯，那就更不要说是长辈那一代，像我妈妈，她出生于呃五十年代，他们还经历过这种吃不饱的阶段，甚至衣服就吃不饱、穿不暖的那么一个阶段。在大城市工作、受过高等教育的这一代相对年轻的阶层吧，并不会担心在物质方面的这个需求。这个地方就是三里屯，北京的三里屯，差不多就是北京比较看起来比较时尚、比较年轻的一个地方吧。比如说这边是一个苹果店，然后周围的话有很多奢侈品店。年轻这一代会觉得中国经受百年屈辱，经受外国的侵略，然后经受过内战，然后贫困，然后在某个阶段进行改革开放，然后实现一个经济的一个发展。所以我觉得，在很多的年轻人看来，那就是一种很大的成就。所以他们会因为这个来激发一个更强的一个爱国情绪。Tensions with a foreign power has made the Chinese more patriotic than ever. This doesn't just stem from current geopolitics; it has deep roots in patriotic education. 
主义教育，它是从小学一直贯穿到大学，甚至你去考研、考博士的话，就基本上是所有的小孩子。都要加入的一个组织，它更像是一种组织的一个概念吧。就是说，通过这个组织，呃，你会当然里面也会传达一种爱国主义的教育，包括共产主义的教育。小孩子明显的表现就是你去戴一个红领巾嘛，然后你可能学到的东西就是说，这个红领巾是呃中国国旗的一角，先辈的鲜血染红的这些东西。可能每个人都听过，就你问中国的所有人，无论是什么年龄，没见过之后的这这中国人，可能都经历过这个阶段。When it comes to patriotic education, there is one site in China that is essential for every school child. Yuan Ming Yuan. Every year, tens of thousands of Chinese visit what they regard as a crime scene. The destruction of the Yuan Ming Yuan Palace in 1860 during the Opium War continues to hang over relations between Beijing and the West. Yuan Ming Yuan is known as the Garden of Perfect Brightness. 圆明园是非常典型的清代政治中心，而且就是它在清代发挥政治中心的作用，甚至在一定程度上超过了故宫。Yuan Ming Yuan is regarded as China's ground zero. The looting of countless valuables by invading French and British forces, and then the decision by the English forces to burn it to the ground, is part of mandatory lessons for every Chinese child. 我从小受到的教育就告诉我，圆明园是万园之园，然后它如此的美丽，但是它被毁坏了。那么我们今天到圆明园现场，也只能看见被毁坏后的结果。To help people imagine Yuan Ming Yuan in its full glory, He Yan and her team has been working painstakingly on a digitization project for the last 20 years. We have to dig out the old things from 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 the old things. 把它这样一个历史的这样一个遗存吧，从大概只有百分之五的线索，百分之二十的遗存，那么到补齐到它可能曾经百分之百、百分之九十五这样子的一个精准的一个形象。它是当时中国最美的东西。我想，在当时那个英国人下令烧毁圆明园的时候，他们想的也是这一点，他们想毁坏中国最好的东西。在这个英国人留下的这个日记里面，他们就写到：“我要摧毁皇帝最心爱的东西，我要让他感觉到这种深刻的痛。”啊，我想，如果是说吸取经验教训的话，就是说，可能我们要更多的去关注我们跟世界的关系，就是能够避免一切的战争，都是全世界人应该共同的心愿。但是说，如果一旦遇到你不得不反抗的时候，我想你还是要反抗。你还是要去守护。圆明园对于我们这一代人来说，就是从小到大的历史教育和爱国主义教育当中非常重要。很多人其实他会想到圆明园，会想到说这是一个耻辱的一个符号，是一个落后就要挨打的一个证明，一个证据。中国被西方国家、先进的、发达的这种西方国家来，就是一种侵略行为吧。可能中国人觉得学到的东西就是要发展国家，要自强不息。When the Communist Party took power in 1949, it proclaimed an end to the century of humiliation. The visit of Nixon in 1972 changed the trajectory of modern China and how it engaged the West. In 2001, with the support of the U.S., China joined the World Trade Organization. Bilateral trade boomed. Even chili sauce made in China found its way to American homes. By allowing China to integrate into the global economy, it left 800 million people out of poverty. So I think China has indeed benefited tremendously from the stability fostered by the U.S. in the post-Cold War era.
I think the Beijing Olympics signaled China's arrival as a global power. And it was evident for those of us in Washington watching the drummers that this was a new kind of power. In 2008, I think historians will look back on it as a consequential year, in part because of the Beijing Olympics, but also because of the global financial crisis. Huang Qishan, now vice president at the time, who was the vice premier in charge of finance and trade with the US, basically lectured the US side. You know, we, China, thought you, Washington and New York, knew how to run a modern economy. We, China, were, were figuring out different aspects of our economy and our financial system based on what you guys were doing. And now, because of your mismanagement, the whole world is in crisis. You are no longer able to teach us. You are no longer a teacher and we are no longer a student. In the next decade, the sense of patriotism and pride that the Chinese felt kept step with economic growth. And this patriotism reached a fever pitch in 2019. The 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China was marked with great fanfare. China had a lot to celebrate. Millions lifted from poverty, futuristic cities, a wealthy middle class, and a global Belt and Road Initiative that saw massive projects flying the Chinese flag everywhere, from Russia to Myanmar to Africa. 对于中国庆祝七十周年的这个时刻，大家的那种激动和自豪，它是非常的真诚，然后发自内心所展现出来的。大家的一个感觉就是说，中国以前很弱、很不朽、很差，只能是受人欺负的那样一个角色。那当当
As mainland China celebrates the 70th anniversary of communism rule, Hong Kong is shaken by protests. As events escalated, the U.S. and China clashed over Beijing's new national security law in Hong Kong. Washington criticized Beijing's move to undermine Hong Kong's freedoms and autonomy, while Beijing accused Washington of interfering in its internal affairs. The trade war already made America seem an adversary to China in 2019. The American response to events in Hong Kong was like adding oil to fire. In July 2020, the signatures of more than 1.65 million Hong Kong residents were submitted to the U.S. Consulate General to express opposition to American interference in Hong Kong affairs. Stanley Ng is the president of the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. The organization is the largest labor group in Hong Kong with over 410,000 members. He led the protests at the U.S. consulate. Kamakao 就是呼籲制裁中國制裁香港明顯就是勾結這些外國勢力破壞也很大的經濟所受到的衝擊是極巨大的首先就是旅遊業、餐飲業 我們現在看到在岸的,有三千的學生,這些的學生是很無辜的,因為有些認知他們可能是很誠實,但是在這些這樣的黑暴或者這些政棍裡面去煽動他們,因此而犯了法。這些創傷、這些前途受到影響是非常令人痛心的我相信他是想要先用香港這個做一個橋頭堡然後影響內地大家知道中美的關係現在是越來越緊張所以他會千方百計來當他是一個棋子也好當他是一個橋頭堡也好其實他是想要用利用香港而香港正正是一個處於一個兩制的一種制度底下而這個一個兩制法律上是有漏洞的他覺得這裡是可以可乘的一個機會來的所以我覺
But opinions in Hong Kong are deeply divided over whether the U.S. had a role to play in the city's troubles. The U.S. actually support uh, all, any social, uh, any democratic movement in the world because that is their own values. They, they think democracy is uh, 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 the best model in the world. So they do get some moral support from the United States. Many people have that bad hand fear reason that or that may be a secret government probably the United States behind all the movement. But if you chase uh, the resources of the protester, uh, the money they have, or, or, or the supplies they have, they are mostly coming from uh, the people itself, the people of Hong Kong. Uh, because nowadays with the digital economy, with all the internet, all the technologies, they can do the crowdsourcing. When you look at all the evidence, all the news reports, or even from the reports of the government itself, uh, there is no evidence that the U.S. are doing any very concrete action to push for that protest or so-called color revolution in Hong Kong. I think if you do a public opinion survey, I think very few of them will believe that there's a bad hand, particularly the U.S. government, behind the whole movement. As debates still continue on whether or not the U.S. had a hand in the unrest in Hong Kong, the U.S., in response to the national security law, ended the special status that it granted Hong Kong in diplomatic and trade relations. It also imposed sanctions to officials over their roles in cracking down on political dissent. Even as the Titans continue to trade blows over Hong Kong, Taiwan has become another flashpoint. In 2020, the U.S. enacted laws that allowed U.S. warships to make port calls in Taiwan. And arms sales from U.S. to Taiwan increased, with a high-profile ceremony at the launch of a joint F-16 fighter jet maintenance center in Taiwan in August 2020. This center is the first F-16 service facility in the Indo-Pacific region. All of this is remarkable because Washington once did all it could to downplay its military exchanges with Taipei to avoid infuriating Beijing. On the part of China, an unusually high number of Chinese military maneuvers near Taiwan is increasing tension. The United States, superpower, world's biggest economy, home to the world's most powerful media and internet companies. There are many things that Americans can be proud of, all of which was built on its industrial backbone. But America has been grappling with something for two decades now, deindustrialization. Dayton, Ohio is one city in America's Rust Belt with a long heritage of manufacturing. What, what happened to the factories? They used them up. Everybody downsized, they could just split. They employed everybody for years. And then they just, I don't know what really happened. They just paid them to retire and, and let them go. And just, that was it, that's that. There's your severance pay, it's over. Those 
Those were the days, golden and true. This is the place someday I'll return to. My dad worked for General Motors, and my mom was like a real estate agent. And they really brought home the idea that if you worked hard, that you'd be able to do well in this country. And so my brother's an attorney now in Cincinnati, uh, and uh, here I am, uh, the mayor of the city of Dayton. So, uh, you know, that whole idea of the American dream played out well. And now it's lost on the waves of time. Far from the shores of this life Gone, baby, gone Take me home Where I belong This kind of fell apart, really, I think, in around the early 2000s. This contract broke with the loss of manufacturing jobs that were slowly trickling in Dayton. The thought process in the second half of the 20th century was you work hard, you play by the rules, your children will reap those rewards. And that's really what the American dream is. For the first time in our country, what we're experiencing is that's not the case. Uh, you know, children of um, families aren't doing better than their parents. And I think that's the broken, the broken dream that's happening right now. From 2001 to 2007, the Dayton metro area lost almost 23,000 jobs. Nearly one in three local manufacturing jobs vanished. As that happened, the poverty rate here climbed to 34.5%, nearly three times the poverty rate nationwide. How did Dayton get here? At one point, it was considered the Silicon Valley of its age. This community, we were known as a city of 1,000 factories. We were producing all manner of different types of things. We led the nation per capita in terms of the number of US patents issued. There was really a spirit of innovation and creativity here. Dayton was where aviation was invented. Wilbur and Orville Wright really taught themselves how to fly while flying above an old cow pasture in Dayton, Ohio. In many real ways, this is the world's first practical airplane. Dayton was where the cash register was invented. Every one of these registers was built, every piece and every part of it built close by our museum at the National Cash Register Company factory here in Dayton, Ohio. Factories here manufactured stoves, refrigerators, bikes, cars, trucks, you name it. For much of the 20th century, Dayton, Ohio was the place to be if you were looking for a job and looking for a way to, to get ahead. By the time the 1990s and 2000s are rolling around, we see a lot of our large corporations in this community um, starting to struggle. To understand why what happened 20 years ago continues to reverberate in American politics today, we need to turn back the clock to 2001. That year, the U.S. government supported the motion that China be allowed into the World Trade Organization. Opening the economy of China, the agreement will create unprecedented opportunities for American farmers, workers, and companies to compete successfully in China's market while bringing increased prosperity to the people of China. As factories moved overseas, some estimates were that five million manufacturing jobs were lost. Economists thought it would be temporary, but some communities never recovered from the shutdown of these factories. From 1997, which was a high water mark, the United States has lost about five million manufacturing jobs, uh, which is uh, between 25 and 30 percent of the total. Entire industries have been wiped out, sectors such as uh, textiles, apparel, furniture, also uh, large segments of the electronic industry. 
A lot of the trade deals that have been executed over the last 25 years have put America at a competitive disadvantage. I think in the case of China, what I would say is, like what many people would say is, just in sheer numbers, you know, uh, the Chinese population is so much larger than the U.S. population. I think one person uh, at, a, at an educational conference I was at put it best when they said, China has more advanced learners than we have learners. And so if you're involved in trying to find jobs, you know, uh, at one point the Chinese government was trying to find jobs for approximately 20 million Chinese per year. Well, 20 million is about the population of the entire state of Ohio. Globalization is necessary and it is going to happen, but unlike other countries like Germany or other, other countries that protected their worker, the American um, government did not. And the hollowing out of the middle class that has really happened over our country over the past 20, 30 years uh, has really sown this anger in communities like across the Midwest. These workers find themselves in places like Walmart, working at minimum wage with no benefits, and their children have no benefits. Likewise, uh, these factories uh, were often uh, uh, the most important part of the tax base. So income tax revenues go down. As a result, the communities themselves decay. They have to lay off teachers, police, firefighters. So it's become a well-known process of what's called the, uh, the Rust Belt, uh, the evolution of the Rust Belt here in the United States. Every manufacturing job in the United States supports about 1.75 additional jobs upstream in the supply chain. These are people that provide services like law and accounting. And when the plants go, many of those jobs go with them. Here at House of Bread, the number of people seeking aid has been increasing steadily every year. We are what's known as a community kitchen. And by that, we mean that we offer a place for people in our local community um, to be able to come seven days a week, to be able to receive a, a free, nutritious lunchtime meal. We were seeing a huge increase in families coming into us in around 2005, 2006. What poverty looks like in, in Dayton is of the 200 plus people that we're serving every day here, about 40% of our guests are, are homeless, and I mean street homeless. Some people have housing, but it's not the suburbs that you think of. It's, it's housing where there may not be running water. There may not be a working refrigerator. There may or may not be a working stove. It's houses that are next to other houses that, that are boarded up that are not, you know, habitable, but you may have squatters in because people need a dry place to sleep. It's disheartening, honestly, that in, in America, you know, in our country, that, that we really allow anyone to lack the basic resources. We talk about this being the land of opportunity. Um, and if you're poor, this is not the land of opportunity. This is the land of a very deep funnel that you've fallen in and you're trying to climb back up and there's no handles. And you know, really shame on us as a country for not really being able to address that issue. The factors driving what I would call US-China tensions, they've been around for many, many years. There's a general perception in the American public that America is losing jobs to China. The middle class feels like they're suffering because their wages have not gone up. So you basically have what I call this middle class revolt, an anti-globalization spirit in the sense that trade, integrating with the global economy, symbolized by China, somehow has depressed the welfare of Americans. And China is basically the target. It's so big. Its economy is now the second largest in the world. 
So this sentiment has been building up for what I would call seven or eight years. And then came the 2016 elections. Trump went to these Rust Belt towns and ran a campaign targeting China. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country. When President Trump ran in 2016, he cited a number of the papers that I had written about jobs lost due to China trade. And he used those aggressively in the campaign. He came across as an outsider, somebody who was going to uh, be the bull in a China shop and shake up Washington. And working people like that image. They want somebody strong who was willing to fight with the powers that be. They blame China's entry into the WTO as being responsible for the loss of their jobs and their communities. Ohio voted for Trump in the 2020 elections. From the time when China joined the WTO in 2001 uh, throughout to, to the end of last year, China has gained in total 13 trillion GDP increase. And the US over this period has gained 11 trillion. The total pie have grown essentially at a similar size. The problem really is how that pie is being distributed. In the US, the top 1% of the whole population has a similar amount of wealth uh, as the bottom 90% of the population. So that just gives you an idea how lopsided to the distribution of wealth uh, that uh, the US uh, uh, has, uh, has, uh, uh, has experienced. And so you can't really blame China for how the pie is being cut in the United States, right? Studying the effects of trade is a complex matter. What would a company such as Apple have done without low-cost Chinese assembly workers? Without China, would manufacturing have moved out to India, Mexico, and Southeast Asia anyway? What about the robots and fancy machines that had supplanted workers? Globalization is going to happen, and automation for sure is happening across the world. But for me, it's really about how America decides to protect its workers. Uh, and that's, I think, the most important thing in our relationship with China. As heated debates continue about whether China was to blame for America's economic woes, a pandemic tears through the country. Millions of Americans have been infected with the coronavirus and hundreds of thousands have died. Even before the current crisis erupted, the Sino-American relationship was on life support. But the pandemic may have sounded its death knell. Sales were probably down at least 75 percent. Economic impact disaster loan has been a great help uh, for keeping me afloat. Without that, I probably would have been one of the ones you would have seen that shut down as well. I think I may be able to hang on to uh, September or maybe a year. And that's mainly because of the fact that I own the building. I was into the 14th year of a 15-year mortgage. Now imagine if I was into the fifth year of a 15-year mortgage, we may not be having this conversation. Last count I heard statewide, it was like 700 bars and restaurants were shuttered due to the uh, coronavirus. And I know that every other day in Pittsburgh, you name it, we're just hearing them every day that's disclosing. Well, unfortunately, most people, they usually waited a couple months too late to close up where they're usually really upside down by the time because their emotions is into it and their heart is into it. So usually by the time they close up, they, they're forced to close up. Like the debt is like insurmountable at that point.
My son, he's 21, his best friend had just passed away a week before his 21st birthday. He had passed away from coronavirus. I got a cousin who was in the hospital for about seven days uh, with the coronavirus. He was, uh, he was on oxygen, never made it to the ventilator. People were blaming China. I think everybody felt as though China wasn't being on the up and up when they got their very first outbreak. According to a Pew Research Center survey, 73% of U.S. adults say they have an unfavorable view of China. 78% also placed a great deal or fair amount of the blame for the global spread of the coronavirus on the Chinese government's initial handling of the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan. Around one in four describes China as an enemy of the U.S. The timing of the warnings that came from China to the world is a matter of dispute between China and the U.S. that is unresolved. China state media produced a clip around this targeted at an English-speaking audience. December. Strange pneumonia cases reported. Roger that. January. We discovered a new virus. So what? It's dangerous. It's only a flu. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. Stay at home. It's violating human rights. Amidst the heartache and destruction, the politics of blame has taken root. Trump was saying that the virus was not serious, it would go away in a matter of a few days. That hasn't been the case, and there's no end in sight in terms of the damage to the economy, to jobs. And what do you do? Do you blame yourself for not taking it seriously? Or do you find a scapegoat, and China's a convenient scapegoat? To add insult to injury, China claims to have just had about 85,000 cases and less than 5,000 deaths in a nation of 1.4 billion. The U.S. has a death toll that's more than 60 times over. In the months leading to the elections, both Biden and Trump have taken out advertisements blaming China. I would be on the phone with China and making it clear, we are going to need to be in your country. You have to be open. You have to be clear. We have to know what's going on. But Trump rolled over for the Chinese. He took their word for it. The president tweeted, China has been working very hard to contain the coronavirus. All the negative ads in the world can't change the truth. China is going to eat our lunch. Come on, man. They're not bad folks, folks. The election may be over, but for many, the reckoning will continue. I blame the, the president on down. I mean, start at the top. Everything's the governor's fault because he has to make these hard decisions, whether that's about schools opening up or bars remaining closed, and if it would have just came a uniform decision. I'd like to see us go to, to me personally through a complete shutdown to try to, uh, to try to get a hold on the virus. I would have liked us to mirror some of the methods of Wuhan, China, and to get a hold of this virus, to maybe be on a total lockdown, but the way people lost their minds about wearing a mask and the freedom not to wear a mask. You've got the original tensions between the U.S. and China because of uh, American concerns about China's economic model. And then you've got the pandemic, which comes along. And uh, from Washington's perspective, China hid the information. And then you've got an election campaign in which the president needs to look tough and you've got hawks within the administration. So those variety of factors push the U.S. to push uh, extremely hard on China. What I'd make China do is play by the international rules. 
We are making sure that in order to do business in China, you have to give all your intellectual property. You have to get a, have a partner in China is 51 percent. We would not do that at all. Number one. Number two, we're in a situation where China would have to play by the rules internationally as well. When I met with Xi, that and uh, when I was still vice president, he said we're setting up air identification zones in the in the South China Sea. You can't fly through them. I said we're going to fly through them. We just flew B-52, B-1 bombers through it. We're not going to pay attention. They have to play by the rules. There is little doubt that U.S.-China tensions um, of some sort will continue. It, this is sort of the, the long-term, uh, you know, major geopolitical battle that we're going to be dealing with uh, for the foreseeable future. It's just the, the, the specific implementation of it will differ, and a Biden administration might be better suited to, to working with others and develop an alliance. I think America, for a long time, has been doing a series of actions. 就是在挑动意识形态对抗，就是要在二十一世纪复活冷战。我们的原则很明确，就是不惹事，但也不怕事，不会随小人起舞，但也绝不容他们胡来。我们不希望就是走到说冷战的那一步，我觉得它是对互相之间资源的一种消耗。嗯，但是现在的趋势就变成说，我们越没有这种对话沟通的一个途径，那会造成更多的这种误解。那因为有更多的误解，可能大家又不想去做更多的这种沟通和理解。那我觉得是一个非常危险的事情，尤其是对两个这么大的国家、这么重要的国家。In 2015, Chinese company Fuyao invested about $500 million in a factory in this Rust Belt city, even as a national debate on China and job losses was unfolding. After the General Motors plant closed in 2009, Fuyao came, and we are pleased that that plant is being reused. We've taken our blows, we've lost the jobs, we've had all the, the, the gloom and doom, but I think we've turned a corner in Dayton. We had this huge facility in the Dayton area that had been sitting empty, and to have the Chinese glass manufacturer come in and bring that factory building back to life is certainly a great thing for the community. In the next episodes, we look at the fallout from this superpower rivalry. What happens to companies in China trading with America? And Chinese people living in the U.S. I think being a Chinese person in America, especially this year with the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of that makes me feel or relate to how it might be similar to how Muslims and brown people felt after 9-11. There is a na white supremacist, nativist, xenophobic atmosphere that has been inflamed. And what will the millions of people who depend on bilateral trade between these two superpowers now do? Got trouble in my heart. Trouble in my mind Digging through the wreckage But trouble's all I find the Trouble with the preacher the Trouble with my soul No matter where I hide The trouble gets a hold There's gonna be trouble Trouble all around There's gonna be trouble Trouble all around There's gonna be trouble Trouble